I want to begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me since I feel like I'm rather an outsider to those who have personal relationships or had personal relationships with George Mosse. I was never his student. Indeed, somehow I never managed to meet him personally through all the years uh, that I was a, a German historian, uh, although I certainly read and learned very much from his work. I like to think that if he were still alive, he would be very concerned with the questions that preoccupy this panel, uh, namely the question uh, of whether or not right radical populism today represents a new fascism or whether this label is analytically misleading and politically counterproductive. Um, I tend to be sympathetic to arguments about difference, um, yet fascism is a good word to think with. The rich historiography on interwar fascist movements and regimes provides abundant material for teasing out how right radical populism draws on some elephant elements of its fascist predecessors, modifies or rejects others, and uses new forms, uh, new ideas, and new technologies. It helps us understand how populism responds to the, the distinctive context of the late uh, 20th and early 21st centuries, a globalized, neoliberal, multipolar world, uh, the end of the Cold War, ongoing culture wars, and mass migration and refugee crises, a context that is in substantial ways very different from that after the First World War and the 1920s. Today, I want to use earlier work on fascism as a foil to think through the gender politics of contemporary right radical populism in Europe. And going forward, when I use the term populism, I'm only referring to its right radical variant. The growing literature on populism has generally neglected the entangled nexus of women, gender, family, and sexuality, although that is beginning to change. Since the 1990s, I want to suggest populist radical right parties, PRR parties for short, have been trying to modernize and normalize. That is, they accept the parliamentary rules of the game, even if they want authoritarian variants thereof. They try to avoid uh, and sometimes succeed uh, resorting to fascist language of race, preferring uh, that of culture. They strive to be legitimate coalition partners. And a part of this new, uh, effort to uh, modernize and normalize themselves uh, has been uh, to try to approach questions of family, gender, uh, women, and sexuality in new ways. Uh, the new ways in which they approach gender issues also comes from the changing social base uh, of these new regimes, uh, especially the growing role of women in them. Um, okay. Um, Interwar right-wing movements in Europe, National Socialism and Italian Fascism above all, offered very clear traditional views of gender, family, and sexuality. Militarized masculinity, the patriarchal family were valorized, Kinderküche designated the proper places and functions of women who were excluded from politics and deemed unable to grapple with ideological questions and relegated to special women's organizations, dealing above all uh, with maternity and charity. As the second sex of the master race, Aryan German women were to leave paid work, in theory although not in practice, and have many children. Male homosexuality remained outlawed, however much homosocial bonds uh, were valorized <coughs> and homosexuality uh, continued to exist. In anti-Semitic Nazi ideology and iconography, the Jew was seen as a potential danger to the purity of the Aryan race and as a sexual seducer or predator. Traditional gender ideologies, biological racism, and the marginalization of women persisted in the small neo-Nazi and neo-fascist movements that emerged in the 1950s and 1960s and were primarily supported by men who had been involved uh, in earlier fascist movements. Since the 1990s, however, populist parties in Western, Northern, and Eastern Europe are no longer men or partaien in the old sense. Some have prominent women leaders. Uh, Pia Kiersgaard, I'm mispronouncing her name probably, founded and for 13 years led the Danish uh, People's Party. Marine Le Pen is perhaps the best known uh, woman's leader uh, of the front, uh, uh, the French National Front. Um, 
and has been the most uh, electorally successful. Siv Jensen runs the Norwegian uh, Progress Party. Frauke Petri had a stormy tenure as head of the Alternative for Germany, as did Elisa Weidel, former Goldman Sachs banker, lesbian mother of two, with a Swiss partner of Sri Lankan heritage. This would have been unimaginable in interwar fascist movements. One of the key differences between populism now and interwar fascism is that no one talks of disenfranchising women or excluding them from politics. On the contrary, these parties reach out to women uh, electorally, they run women candidates and promote women functionaries even if they uh, often relegate them to uh, women and the family. And their party platforms uh, speak at length about issues of women, family, and sexuality. On average, 40% of the populist party's electorate is female, uh, <clears throat> a percentage that has been growing. At first glance, this much noted gender gap seems significant, but it turns out it's very typical uh, for uh, right wing and center right uh, parties. Only parties on the left do substantially better in women's, uh, winning women's votes. The existing literature on the gender gap uh, is unsatisfactory, as is in general, I think, the literature on why men and women uh, support these uh, parties. Uh, in terms of women, uh, <coughs> It's generally uh, said uh, that women voters for populist parties are less likely to feel themselves to be the losers of globalization uh, and uh, post-industrial society. They're more likely to have white-collar jobs, uh, et cetera. They are, however, uh, opinion polls suggest, every bit as anti-immigrant and Islamophobic as men. But what do they think of the gender platform of these parties? Nobody has asked, so we know very little. Feminists say they don't particularly like them. Kasmuda, who's probably the most prolific writer on European populism, says, ah, there's no empirical evidence for that. But he, too, hasn't investigated the issue. We know even less about how male voters react to issues of gender, sexuality, and family. Most scholarly literature reduces their motives uh, for voting uh, for the radical right to their economic situation, arguing that unemployment, stagnant or downward mobility, and living in areas with weak economic and social infrastructure encourage them to vote for the populist radical right. Journalists and populist theorists and propagandists, however, speak as well of a male, uh, of a crisis of masculinity, of weakened traditional fatherhood, and of the ostensible miseducation of boys by the state and feminists. Polish activists call for the restoration of formerly hegemonic masculinity. Men in the former GDR say they vote for uh, the IFD not only because they lack jobs, but because they lack marriage partners. They argue that women have been uh, the long-term winners of German reunification, not only taking jobs, but moving west and marrying Vessies. Um, in 2018, uh, the IFD published its uh, infamous advent calendar, uh, and behind each of the 24 windows was not the image of a saint uh, or an angel uh, or anything typical of usual advent calendars, but rather the image of a white man. Uh, these range from Martin Luther and Helmut Schmidt uh, to Ronald Reagan and Thilo Sarrazin. Uh, the explicit aim was, in the words of the AfD, to combat the public denigration of white men. Populism is explicit and vocal about its gender politics. Um, populist party ideology, party programs, electoral propaganda, and the literature produced by a growing network of <coughs> internationally linked groups of far-right intellectuals and organizations speak extensively uh, about four broad themes, family, women's labor force participation, sexuality and reproductive rights, and immigration and Islam. Running through these discussions of each of these is an obsession with what they call gender ideology as the underlying threat to the normative families and sexualities and women's roles that populism favors. Populist views on gender and sexuality do vary from country to country and they have changed somewhat over time. 
As these parties try to modernize, they accommodate to the more mainstream views of their particular national cultures, especially around issues of abortion and homosexuality. In general, the Scandinavian parties are the most liberal, uh, while those in Austria and Eastern Europe are the most conservative. There is much more commonality among these parties in their discourses on Islam and immigration uh, and gender issues associated with them, and all share a rejection of the idea of gender and sexuality as socially constructed. The heterosexual nuclear family with women fulfilling their true calling of motherhood occupies a central place in populist discourse, just as it did in the interwar, uh, in interwar fascism. Regarded as the only acceptable family form, it is described as traditional, but more often as natural, uh, gesturing toward natural law on the one hand and nature and science uh, on the other. The family is viewed as a key building block of society and the protector of national culture and values. Some populists even deploy the language of human rights, arguing uh, that according to Article 16.3 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, the family as they understand it is entitled to protection by society and the state. While the fascist family in the interwar period was to be mobilized behind and incorporated into the fascist movement and state, for populists, the family is to be protected from the state. The new Spanish uh, right-wing Vox Party, for example, states that the family is a reality existing before the state, and this natural family has to be defended legally and supported materially. Uh, the Freedom Party in Austria argues that the state should not interfere with parental rights, and along with the Swiss People's Party, opposes any state-run child care. Many of these populist movements also oppose UN and EU conventions on domestic violence, arguing that they represent an unfair uh, interference in the private sphere. At first glance, the ideal is the neoliberal, self-reliant, and autonomous family responsible for its own welfare, education, and socialization. But not entirely. Populist parties also advocate social policies that will support uh, they hope, this natural family, such as tax benefits for families, child allowances, and flexible work schedules to enable women to combine work in motherhood, uh, or better still, to choose to be full-time wives and mothers. These are, of course, only to go to uh, women and families of the dominant ethnicity in any given state. Uh, and the populists are very clear uh, that uh, they advocate a kind of welfare socialism that will uh, limit uh, or eliminate uh, benefits uh, to uh, migrants and refugees. Marine Le Pen even goes so far as to favor a maternal income equal to the minimum wage and pensions for stay-at-home mothers. Uh, wages for housework, a radical demand of some second wave feminists in the 1970s and 1980s, has now migrated to the radical right as a as a part uh, of a host of positive and negative pronatalist measures. Populist parties not only want natural families, but they want large ones. Uh, they see increasing the birth rate as necessary uh, to <coughs> uh, provide an alternative to immigration and to sustain an aging population and fulfill labor market needs. Some French, Dutch, and German populists argue that unless uh, their nationals have more children, Europe will face the danger of a demographic holocaust and a great replacement uh, by Muslims. This is a defensive and frightened pronatalism that seems to me to be very different from the interwar counterpart that linked large families uh, to expansion and national glory. Although populist parties uh, regard motherhood as women's true vocation and staying home as a choice women would make if it were possible, they realize uh, that this is uh, not possible in the current situation and so end up arguing by and large for a sort of modern traditional kind of family in which women uh, will combine uh, motherhood and work either in different phases of their lives or at the same time with support from the state. 
The focus of these discussions on family uh, overwhelmingly involves women and women as mothers. Uh, surprisingly little attention is paid to masculinity. Interwar fascism wanted men to be militant and muscular, nationalistic and anti-Semitic, willing to use violence and sacrifice oneself for the fatherland. Um, <clears throat> For populist parties who are trying to create a more modern image, the street fighter, the student dueler, the tough blue collar worker, uh, and the former paramilitary is certainly uh, not uh, an ideal model. One of the interesting things is that populist party leaders, male, but also many of the women as well, often present themselves as competent, efficient, and knowledgeable economic experts uh, and respect respectable bourgeois functionaries. To be sure, this gets combined in these parties with uh, many of the leaders arguing that, then others using more explosive and provocative language, and in, certainly in the case of Germany and the alternative for Germany, supported out on the streets by uh, a much more violent-prone subculture and organizations uh, like Pegida. <coughs> Whatever their attitude or model of masculinity is, however, these movements insist that men uh, should be fathers in stable heterosexual marriages, and they claim that the state and feminists are eroding fathers' rights. Sexuality presents multiple challenges uh, <coughs> to the ideal natural family of populist dreams uh, around issues of reproductive rights, LGBT movements, and sex education in schools. Populist parties are divided on the issue of abortion, not on its undesirability, but on its continued legality. Um, <coughs> Scandinavian and Dutch populist parties accept abortion as a right, uh, while Jean-Marie Le Pen, the founder of the Front National, uh, <coughs> regarded abortion as an anti-French genocide. His daughter, the current party leader, says that she will respect the legality of abortion because enough support is not available so that women can reasonably choose not to have one. The Hungarian uh, Fidesz party has gone to the opposite extreme and in 2011 incorporated a clause into the Constitution saying life is, begins at conception. Overall, and for reasons I think we don't know quite enough about, European populists have been much less successful than their American counterparts in uh, eroding access uh, to abortion and in pushing through the kind of conscious clauses, uh, conscience clauses that would allow medical professionals uh, not to uh, perform abortions or even discuss them. LGBT rights are a major preoccupation preoccupation uh, of the populist radical right, but the concern is less with outlawing homosexual acts uh, than with banning gay marriage uh, or preventing its legalization. In France in 2012, the Front National was part of the massive Vanif Potu that drew tens of thousands to Paris to protest the proposed Tabira law on marriage for all. Protesters claim that gay marriage would jeopardize the foundations of human identity and lead to a denatured society. They reject gay parenting, whether through adoption, surrogacy, or reproductive technologies. And some of the uh, right-wing umbrella organizations like the World Congress of Families, which is linked up to these populist parties, go so far as to say no surrogacy under any circumstances because it will start one down a slippery slope. In tones of moral panic, many on the populist radical right hold up the endangered child as a symbol of contemporary moral and cultural crisis. Secular national governments, the EU, and schools expose children ostensibly to false ideas about the social construction of gender, the naturalness of homosexuality, and the possible varieties of families. According to right radical populists, this pernicious miseducation of children, along with threats to the natural family and the spread of LGBT rights, is due to and justified by something they call gender ideology. Populist parties, with the AfD, the FPÖ, and the Polish Law and Justice Party in the lead, have joined a growing movement against gender ideology, or what in France is usually referred to as gender theory. 
These are capacious uh, and <clears throat> amorphous terms for a variety of ideas, policies, and behavior that populists demonize. Gender ideology is, as the title of one recent study suggests, the symbolic glue that holds together the seemingly disparate concerns of populace with the birth rate and gay adoption, sex education and employment quotas, in vitro fertilization, and abortion. Anti-genderism is a response to the multiplicity of family forms, sexual practices, and women's lives uh, that emerged from the, central revolution, from the cultural revolution of the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and it's <coughs> it marks a rejection of their instantiation in national and international laws. Anti-genderism is also a response to new theories about gender. And one of the interesting things is there are lots of references to feminist theory uh, and to Judith Butler, who is particularly demonized. Not clear how well uh, they have read or understood her, but certainly she is named uh, as a good part uh, of the problem. Populists not only want to combat particular practices, but to refute uh, the underlying justification, which is dismissed as mere theory as opposed to fact, or worse still, as ideology, which is said uh, to uh, conjure up the specter of totalitarianism. Opponents of gender ideology insist that men and women are fundamentally different, that difference is rooted in nature, and must be uh, recognized and this difference must be recognized in education and bolstered in social and family policy. While they assert equal rights for women and avoid and accord them political roles, there is an insistence that equal worth does not mean sameness. Gender ideology, it is argued, wrongly insists on the constructed character of gender and sexuality, the fluidity and multiplicity of gender norms, sexual practices, and family forms, and thereby challenges the natural order and the social order built on it. There is a stark biological determinism in populist discourses around gender, family, and sexuality a strong belief that to challenge immutable roles, norms, and practices is to risk the downfall of culture and society. This biological determinism uh, uh, in populist discourse, uh, gender discourse, is at odds with those parties' efforts to avoid explicit discussion of biological racism and then seem to be echoing uh, earlier fascist language. The attack on gender ideology was spearheaded by uh, the Vatican in the wake of the 1994 Cairo Conference on Population and Development and the 1995 Beijing Women's Conference. For over 25 years, Popes Paul VI, John Paul II, and Benedict XVI developed an all-encompassing theory of complementarity with which to combat gender feminism. Deploying the Catholic language of personalism and Christian human rights, they argue that men and women have equal dignity as persons, but that equal dignity is premised on and manifested in essential and complementary differences, physical, psychological, and ontological. Some of these uh, anti-gender ideology uh, People engage seriously with gender theory and try to develop an alternative humanism and anthropology based on complementarity, one that stresses social connections of a conservative sort over the individualism that they associate with both neoliberalism and feminism. Others, uh, such as the widely read and translated German Gabriela Kuby, argue in lurid tones that gender ideology means the destruction of freedom in the name of freedom. It represents uh, a war on Christianity. It promotes a culture of death. Pope Francis, the Ghanaian Cardinal uh, Robert Serra, and Polish populists see gender ideology as a form of what they call ideological colonization promoted by the secular uh, state, international organizations, feminists, and gays. The concept of uh, gender ideology has spread beyond the Vatican and features prominently in a trans set of transnational networks that link populist parties, evangelical uh, Protestants in the US uh, and the Vatican. These include the World Congress of Families, which recently held uh, its uh, 12th annual conference in Verona, where uh, 
Italian uh, Deputy uh, Prime Minister Matteo Salvini came to offer his blessing. The previous meeting was held uh, in Budapest uh, with Orban uh, presiding over uh, the opening uh, session. There's also the Appeal for Europe, a yet more extreme online uh, network that shares information and promotes campaigns uh, against uh, gay marriage, uh, <coughs> reproductive uh, rights, etc. Overall, populist right radical internationalism on questions of gender and culture functions much more effectively than did fascist internationalism in the interwar years. Uh, <coughs> The language of uh, gender ideology, the attacks on it, feature prominently in the rhetoric of several populist parties. Uh, the Austrian Freedom Party uh, talks about supporting Gleichwertigkeit, but not Gleichheit. Uh, the Alternative for Germany uh, electoral program in 2017 said that gender ideology was undermining the classic family as a model for life and roles, and was thus Verfassungsfeindlich. Uh, the 2014 Manif Potu in Paris carried banners with signs reading, No to the theory of gender. Uh, we want sex, not gender. Don't touch our gender stereotypes. Uh, and this is spreading into center right parties as well. In 2016, the CDU party program proclaimed its opposition to gender ideology and early sexualization, both to uh, words that feature uh, prominently in these anti-gender campaigns. These parties also, it should be noted, favor the abolition of gender study programs everywhere, everywhere arguing that they uh, have uh, no, uh, <coughs> they don't uh, represent uh, legitimate uh, disciplines and should be abolished uh, from the university. Um, Gender, I think, has proven a much more useful uh, target than feminism, the preferred enemy of interwar populists. Populist party, or interwar fascism. Populist parties are, to be sure, anti-feminist, but they see gender as somehow, I think, a more encompassing and modern target. By singling out gender ideology, populists and their allies deploy their enemy's key concept against them. The attack on gender ideology brings those committed to uh, essentialism versus constructionism, together with those concerned about abortion, uh, to those who are most strongly opposed to LGBT rights and gay marriage, whether religious or secular. The opposition to gender ideology has, been, has enabled populist movements to both seem more legitimate and normal uh, and to draw in support uh, from uh, center-right uh, conservative parties. If I had time to talk about it, which I don't, the ways in which populist movements uh, talk about the sexual danger represented by immigrants and Islam is another way that they are normalizing themselves and reaching out to allies, not merely from the center-right, but widely from among feminists as well. Um, since I think I'm even over time by now, let me just conclude by saying I think it is really important to look at these kinds of issues in order to understand the success of these movements. It's too easy to say right radical populism is successful just because it's responding to economic transformations and crises or the migration crises. I think we need to look at the way in which they have been at times frighteningly successful in normalizing themselves, seeming more modern and thus legitimate, and the way they talk about women, gender, family, and sexuality has been an integral part of this. It is precisely the ways in which they are different uh, than uh, the interwar fascists that has enabled them, it seems to me, to make significant gains, uh, and it's part of the danger uh, that they represent. Thank you. <laughs>